this evening to Clay Art Centre. My name is Regina Farrell Fagan and I'm the Exhibitions Manager at Clay Art Centre and uh, we're delighted to have you here this evening for Paul Andrew Wandless uh, who's going to do his presentation tonight telling my story. He's a wonderful storyteller himself and his work uh, tells wonderful stories so it should be a really interesting evening. So Paul's based in uh, Chicago. He is a multidisciplined artist. He is an author, a sculptor. He works with ceramics. He's a carver. Um, and I could go on, but I'll let him tell <laughs> you all about himself. Um, but he's a very talented man, a very uh, multidisciplined man. Um, he's also an educator at uh, Harold Washington College. It's a two year program there, and he teaches sculpture and 3D design. Um, and he is also on the board of the Penland School of art. Um, I'm going to let Paul take over and he's going to share his screen. We're broadcasting in gallery view. You should have your Zoom screen on gallery view too. Um, so you can share, see his screen and see him at the same time. And uh, thank you very much, Paul, for uh, making time for us tonight. And I'll let you take it over. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and I thank everyone for for joining. It's a great, great group here from all over the place. I, I was only able, able to look in the participants a little bit, but um, I saw a lot of names I I don't know, but I saw a lot of names I do know. So so thanks for thanks for joining. So I'll just go ahead and start sharing the screen here. And I will make this larger. Okay. So what I wanted to do tonight is it's a little bit of a different kind of, um, I guess, talk for me. Um, typically, a lot of the talks are about my work or how I make my work and things like that. So, so when I when I was asked to do this, I wanted to take a little bit different approach because my work is narrative work, and it does kind of you know it is about telling my story, but it's telling my story kind of how I see the world, what I think about the world and just sort of my general musings on things. And it's also celebratory of just material. Um, you know, I, I love being an artist. I love the different materials that I can work with, the different ways I can work, um, <clears throat> whether it's printmaking, pottery, I love alternative firing, uh, leatherworking, stone carving, clay, uh, wood. So, so these are all things that I enjoy. And I, I feel as that being an artist, you have the opportunity to create and the things that you can create are very much dictated by the skill set you have. So, so in doing this, um, so these are my, uh, some of my professors. I got my undergraduate degree at University of Delaware um, with Victor Spinsky. And then after that, um, I went to Minnesota State University, Mankato, studied with Jim Tanner and Roy Straussberg. Um, I got my MFA in, uh, at Arizona State University. Um, Kurt Weiser, he's still there, uh, and Jeannie Otis and Randy Sch uh, Schmidt were my other professors. Um, but with Victor, you know, he was my undergrad professor, and I was, you know, I worked for him after I graduated, but, um, and then, you know, Jim Tanner is like a father figure to me, and Roy was also instrumental, but this photograph is from my uh, wedding reception, and um, I think, you know, I know that there's some, you know, professors and instructors in this call and some students as well. And I always like to point out that the relationships that you have with your professors, you know, your professors become friends, they become mentors, and these are lifelong relationships that we have. And, and that's part of my story too. Um, they very much have influenced not only who I am as an artist, but who I am as a person also. So a lot of things that I do are, are reflections. Um, now, the other thing too, um, when I grew up, I loved doing art, but I never thought of myself to, to be an artist. Um, but I was thinking about what was the first thing I saw that maybe made me want to be an artist, or at least let me know that people could be artists that look like me. Uh, I mean, as African American, as a, you know, growing up, you know, as a black child, you know, you don't see a lot of examples of yourself as an artist, but there was one. And this is the first painting I saw, and if any of you are familiar with this, this is from Good Times, right? So when I was young, I watched Good Times all the time. It was one of my favorite shows, and this was the painting that we saw all the time in the intro. This is by Ernie Banks, and I love the dynamic um, type of composition this is, and this is me talking about it now, but, you know, when I was young, 
I just love the painting, the, the activity, people are having fun, people are dancing. And um, it's just a, looked like a great time. So this was kind of my introduction to art, especially like figurative uh, painting. So, so I like to show that image because I think all of us at some point saw something that we responded to when we were young. It may not be the impetus that got us into art, but these are still things that stick with you. Um, so as far as storytelling goes, so this is, you know, like I said, I want to talk a bit more, I guess, about aesthetics and how do I use storytelling and devices of storytelling to kind of have my work have some kind of narrative so I can have a dialogue with, with the audience. And also, how do I use different uh, things like symbols and iconography? And, you know, this is in my studio just working. So as far as the different devices I use, um, I think of narrative as a broad kind of definition, you know, just a story, an accounting or representation of real or imagined situation and events that covers a lot of things. But specifically, like mythology is something I'm very interested in. So, you know, stories with supernatural beings, they reinforce or explain cultural beliefs, allegories. Um, and then those type of things become legends, right? If they're told over and over enough, people start to believe them and accept them as true. Um, and then symbols are something that I use in all of my work in one form or fashion. And symbols um, are things that derive meaning uh, from its maker or the time period or the culture that it exists in. So symbols can mean different things to different people um, in different time periods, as opposed to an icon, which is universal and the meaning is not bound to a time or a culture. I mean, everybody reads it the same way. So when I'm putting, so when I'm thinking about my work, what I'm thinking about is how can I use these existing devices and these, this existing language of, of symbols and icons that are out there and then incorporate it into my work. Um, so I have kind of three different vehicles that I use for this. And I normally either like to make these big heads um, where I work around the perimeter of it to tell a story or tell a narrative, or I use figures. And with the figures, uh, they tend to be something that are a manifestation of an idea or a manifestation of a of a narrative that I want to tell, and then the prints, you know, they're they're pictorial, so I can do a lot with prints, um, whether I do it on paper, on clay, or a painting. But you know, prints, you're really being able to kind of stretch what you want to communicate with folks. And when I was an undergraduate at University of Delaware, I took a class called Myth, Religion, and Art, and that particular class really um, impacted me because it talked about how every culture um, told the same stories but used different names for the characters that were in there or they always came up with ways to they where they could explain the unexplainable um, to their children like, for example why is the sun in the sky by itself but the moon's in the sky with its family you know how, why, how did the leopard get its spots um, no, things like that um, so i found them interesting i love you know greek greek mythology roman mythology um, Ethiopian fables. Um, so I've just started then to read a lot of different kinds of um, uh, myths and fables, and just because they were interesting stories to me. And then I also got more interested in philosophy as well, in terms of um, you know, having an opinion, having a belief, having a set of ideas that you then can apply aesthetically to your work. And then also you're sharing your view with, with folks with philosophy. Because, um, you know, rhetoric like with Plato, you know, said that rhetoric is something where you try to convince a lot of people about something, um, but that doesn't stick for very long. But with philosophy, you're just trying to um, make one person believe. And I think through my artwork, that's all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to make necessarily grand statements with my work that I hope a broad audience all receives in the same way. Um, I'm trying to keep my work personal where I'm sharing my views, I'm sharing my experiences, and I'm sharing my beliefs and musings. So hopefully someone out there individually can connect with that because there's we all have shared experiences. And the more that I can be honest through my work or the more that I can tell more about myself or experiences through my work, then that gives the work an opportunity for someone else then to connect with at that same level, that same personal level where they can hopefully see an aspect of themselves in, uh, reflected in the work somehow. So, so we're going through, I have different kinds of um, things that I like to look at as well. Um, so aesthetically, I, I like heads, but I wanted to not, I don't make anything that's necessarily 
uh, realistic. They're a little bit naturalistic, but there's a lot of um, abstraction going on. So I love these Olmec colossal heads. I like the way that they um, just focus on particular features. They're very direct. They're very um, kind of stoic in a way, but in terms of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the brow, uh, those are kind of the important uh, features on there. And then I also look at something that might look like a head to me. So this, this um, uh, Shiva Supreme Teacher, this form is something I'm interested in. I'm interested in all of the symbol, symbolism in there and iconography that's in there. And then when I looked at this, I noticed that the top of it looks kind of like a forehead to me. And then the tree um, looks a little bit like a nose to me. Uh, now with this, this is one of my favorite vessels, um, the Prometheus vase. Um, I believe this is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, but there, there are probably other examples of these as well. Uh, this really encapsulates um, something I would love to do at some point, make a large vessel and do this, but but this is the, um, you know, the story of uh, Prometheus and stealing fire and then you know being punished for that. So this is using sculptural forms around the top and also pictorial images around the sides of the vessel to tell this entire myth. So with one object, a large, long story is being told. So works like this are what I look at to say, well, when I'm going to do my work, what's going to be my solution? So when I look at artwork, I don't look at it necessarily to do a version of things that I'm uh, using, say, as a resource or a reference. But, uh, you know, I don't work in a vacuum. I mean, these objects exist and I like doing research. I like to see what's out there. So, so I'm not reinventing the wheel, right? I want to add to the vocabulary that's out there. I want to utilize this language and utilize um, these ways of communicating so people don't have to figure out how am I communicating. I'm just, I'm just communicating just like these other works that you're used to seeing, but I'm using my own uh, visuals. So this is an example of um, you know, the, these heads that I make. Um, I just really focus on the nose, the brow, and the mouth, and that gives me much more surface area than where I can become a painter and just use the surface as a canvas. But you see how it does mimic that, that one particular piece that I showed previously. So as far as when I'm using mythologies, um, I love telling these stories about supernatural beings or events. Now to explain cultural, um, to explain something cultural as far as beliefs, these are my cultural beliefs, you know, what I think is important or the these myths that I'm creating. I do a lot of writing and I've always loved to write. I've always loved to read. Um, you know, I grew up reading um, The Hobbit, you know, Lord of the Rings, Narnia, Tarzan, and you know, I, I'm still an avid reader of, of, of fantasy and I like writing fantasy. I like writing short stories. So often I'm writing things that are kind of metaphors for what's going on in my life or around me or things that I see or I respond to. And then I find a way, well, how can I tell that story through through my work? So, so this is the birth of Gemma. And so with the heads, and I'm not going to talk too much about what each, each individual one means, but uh, more so about how you storytelling with this. Um, so in my mythologies, I have these, these characters, these people that are representational of um, certain aspects. So with Gemma, um, the front of the head, you see this has to do with the sea, the ocean. You know, I grew up back east. I love going to the ocean. So a lot of things have these water type of themes in here. And I have this kind of this muse, uh, Gemma, in here with this shell bodice. And I have a certain amount of um, flowers here. There's 23. Each has three petals. There's a shell here. And then these are um, made with sprigs going around. So, so I have this character where this is the birth of this character, reminiscent of right, Aphrodite. Um, like the birth of Venus, you know, image by Botticelli. So, so I do look at things, I do look at formats and as like, how can my characters work in here? But as a larger, in a larger context, it's more about these, this birth of ideas, this birth of something that is to me about the water, um, something about being back east, something about being at the beach, all these senses that you have while you're on the beach, um, you know, capturing them in this one particular piece. Um, now, typically, you can only see the front and backs of pieces. So I want to have this little short video here where you can see if you turn this piece around, this is Andorra. Um, you have these angelic figures, the snake underneath where the jawline, which is like a mimicking a mountain and beard. 
And then you see this bird being released uh, by Andorra. And then she's in these woods. And then you see these other birds you know, that she can also utilize. And then, but still out of her hand is slithering the snake that again is going underground. Um, symbolism for me, like snakes and um, birds for me are like messengers. Uh, snakes are also about life, you know, sloughing off skin, starting new. Uh, birds are about sending messages, seeing things coming back. Um, so this type of uh, this type of symbolism is something that I use quite a bit in my work to show those. I also use go across different mediums. Um, the way that you see other artists through history use different mediums to tell a similar story um, by using this birth of Gemma, the stone carving I did is the same thing. Um, but it gives me an opportunity to present the work a little bit differently. So it, it's still the figure, there's, the shell is still there, and then the wave is still there. Uh, with the scape and the knee, and, um, this one kind of boils down to, um, we all have things that we are metaphorically escaping. Um, and whatever this thing is that we might be battling, um, you know, by ourselves. And we always have help you know, to try to, to with overcoming these things. And that's kind of what that muse figure is. And then in the front of the piece, with again, these two angelic figures, these two deities um, are again about reaching out for something, reaching out for help. And that's what those shells are, are kind of the help or this thing that we're, we're going for. Um, the shells for me, especially the Nautilus ones, comes from growing up where on the beach, we would pick up a shell, put it to our ear, and then our, you know, our mom always used to say, you know, bring the shell home, put it to your ear, and you'll hear the ocean still in there. So like memories like that stick with me, and, and that's sort of where I get some of my um, iconography from for that or symbols. Uh, this is also a print, the same scene, um, but this is, you know, in the other image, Indian was the head. Um, and here it's the same muse, the same person. Here you can see the bottom jaws, the boat being swallowed. So when it's a pictorial, when it's a pictorial piece, but this is a clay print, um, it gives me the opportunity to put all of these things in one small window for you to see. Uh, a bit like the Prometheus phase where you're telling multiple stories in one, um, in kind of one cell, right? So that's sort of what this is. So this is the side by side where you can see the same characters. And lots of times um, I, um, I'll appropriate myself. <laughs> so so that, fi that muse figure that's um, on the head, I traced that, um, you know, just put a piece of tracing paper on there and traced her. And then I put that onto a stencil. So that way I could stencil that onto my block. So it's the exact same figure. Um, the person I can draw, you know, over and over. But so this is a way that I can try to stay consistent with my uh, imagery as well. And then this is another little stone carving also, kind of same scene where, again, one is in the end trying to swallow the boat, this Numo narrowly escapes, that's the character. And the other one is just Numo traveling in these dangerous waters and kind of Indian is lurking beneath. So, so the different materials give me a way to um, tell certain stories, but then sometimes are, it is to me more of a mythological telling like the stone carving is um, versus a pictorial telling. And then sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a built-in mythology about that I'm making for myself. So a lot of people are probably familiar with um, like, you know, with blues, like going down to the crossroads, right. And uh, making a deal with the devil to, to have, um, to have talent. Um, it's kind of the thing we're always making deals with ourselves, right. In order to do the things that we want to do. And I feel like as an artist, um, you know, I'm always making um, these packs <laughs> with myself in terms of what are you willing to, to sacrifice as an artist? What are you willing to do to pursue your goals? Um, so Miss Animus is this kind of larger, like goddess-like figure, sort of the, the crossroads person, um, standing, if you will. And time's up, coming to get that vessel that was, you know, gave this person the ability to do these things. And, and compositionally, you know, I have uh, the um, the anvil there, which is about work, the hourglass there, which is about time, the vessel about creating creativity, and that forms a triangle, um, because compositionally, um, when you set things up geometrically in terms of um, directional lines, that helps make these little um, vignettes like within your piece. And then the, his arm is angled, the same angle as Miss Animus's arms coming down, so I'm also creating these sight lines there, as well as in the background with the lines coming down the wall, coming down at that angle. 
Um, so, so these are different things in there where these are things that I'm thinking about while I'm making these pieces. Um, now, whether or not you, you don't have to understand like what's behind this as the actual story or the impetus for me, but if you're looking at this and you can kind of get the sense of time and work and something coming to get something um, in terms of like Miss, Miss Anamis looks like she's reaching out. So she wants something and the character here looks a little bit hesitant to give it away. It's, it's also that kind of um, that struggle there too. Now, lots of times, so that's a, a lino cut. So it was a lino cut that I printed on paper because I normally do an, a short edition on paper, but then I also use a lino cut to print on a plaster bat and then also make a color version of it as a clay print. Um, and the process flops it and color completely changes images. So I do like the black and white of an image because it is just about the image and the mark making. Um, when you add color, then you can do different types of things with depth and nuance uh, that you can't with a black and white print. So I also enjoy utilizing the image and seeing it different ways as well. Um, as far as the character, again, I, I do kind of revisit characters. So this is a stone carving of Miss Animus as well with um, translucent alabaster and some more opaque alabaster and again it's there's things that i don't just make a piece about uh, an idea or a subject and then move on to a new idea these are ideas and people and characters that are with me for years and years that every couple of years so for it will that idea will pop up again or that theme will come back and i want to reinvestigate that idea um, allegories tend to be something i i also enjoy in terms of you know having hidden meanings in there so so with the other ones, they are kind of like these, my own myths that I write, these short stories that I'm kind of metaphorically speaking about something, but the allegories, I, these are things that I have these kind of hidden meanings in there with much more symbolism in there. So this is, you know, just me working on a, on a lino cut. Um, so with these works that are more, that are flat works, I do compositionally have a very specific way I like to work on them. I do like to have a shallow sense of space and I do use elongated figures purposely. I like stylized figures. And this is another one you know, with Botticelli, where again, lots of symbolism, lots of characters and lots of meaning in here. This is for um, you know, uh, Medici, um, there's a wedding in May, it's a spring wedding. So this is all about that where you know Venus is in the center, uh, Cupid is above her. Um, you can see how there is an arch, an arch around her that kind of frames her in the center. And then to the left, you have the three graces and then Mercury on the far left, which is the god of May. Um, and then to the far right, you have, um, you know, Zephyr and Chloris, um, you know, god of wind. And then Chloris um, was a nymph. And then when they, um, you know, were, became a couple, she became uh, Flora, which is a spring deity, which is who the person is about to throw petals. So, and then they're in the orange grove, which are symbols for Medici. So it's all, it's all laden with symbolism. And in this time period, everybody knew who these characters were. So when people looked at this painting, they knew that this was about a, a spring wedding in May, and they knew it was the Medicis with the orange. So, so this was imagery that people could look at and, and know, um, know what was going on. And then again with Botticelli, reusing right figures right this is still venus but more so influenced by um aphrodite the the greek version which um typically are nudes um again that sense of um shallow sense of space again zephyr and um and chloris in the left and then this is horror i think and not and not flora but still a spring deity so so what i'm doing isn't anything new in a sense of approach um lots of artists have themes that they revisit over time or, or characters or subject matter that they revisit over time. Uh, another thing I'm very interested in is uh, an artist in the studio. Um, all of us are in our studios working all the time. And for me, the stories that I'm telling when I make work about a, an artist in the studio is it's celebratory. Um, the thing I like most about art sometimes is the making of the art, uh, my time in a studio. For me, a lot of times it's solitary. Uh, my, um, I, my studio, I'm in there by myself, but I remember when I was a student, I have great memories as an undergrad and a grad and all the camaraderie that I had with my students then, or with my, um, with my peers then who I was going, going to school with and they're lifelong friends. So, so the studio for us where we make our work, I mean, that, that's a special place. And 
and I and I appreciate that. Um, and the studio, but the studio work that I make, as far as imagery goes, it's also about the materials and the discipline and the craft. And this Carrie James Marshall uh, image, you know, he's talking about the artists in the studio, but there's different painting styles that are also represented in here that he did purposely to show the different ways that artists paint instead of a male artist um, with a female um, muse you see it's a female artist and it's a male a male muse in the back in terms of the model so he, a lot of commentary going on in this and but Carrie um, what he you know one of the things that he's he said about his work is that when he has ideas about his work he knows one thing he knows for sure is that um, his characters are going to be black and then he goes from there. And that kind of made an impact on me too, because um, when we go to museums and galleries, not all of us see people who look like us depicted in the artwork. Um, so one of my first decisions that's easy is that all of my characters are gonna be brown. They're gonna be some shade of brown. And so that way, if I do have work in a gallery, if I do have work in a museum, museum um, people who are like me will see people who look like them now. And I think if everyone does that with their work, um, then we'll have a greater diversity on the walls of museums and galleries if we start making work that looks like ourselves or reflects ourselves in some manner. And because my work in particular is not, it's not directly or, or overtly political or social, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have that intensity of those ideas behind it. It's just I have a different way of, of, of communicating it. Um, Jacob Lawrence as well, one of my favorite artists because of that shallow uh, space that he uses, how he stylizes his figures. And I just, I'm always attracted to work of people working in their shops. So, you know, it's cabinet makers, um, shoemaker, you know, so I'm always looking to see what are the little vignettes in there. Because in each one of these paintings, there's always these mini still lives going on um, on the tables. So for me, this particular piece, um, you know, the pottery, um, you know, has a lot going on in terms of probably uh, this is a more recent piece for me um, in terms of kind of being allegorical with lots of symbolism in there. Um, so anytime you see, you know, uh, a brown guy in there with a with a goatee and an apron, that's going to be me. <laughs> you know, it's I insert my myself in everything. So it's all kind of versions of, uh, of um, the self narratives and and quite often the um, that will be my wife that you see there in terms of um, um, if it's curly hair with a gem in there. So this is very, like for me, the studio is about creating. And some of the things in here that for me that I embedded in here, it's almost like a family portrait. Although that's not how I expect other people to see it. This is what I was putting into it in terms of making my decisions. And, you know, about creating, um, you know, uh, gem, you know, holding the vessel that's and the vessel is obviously kind of also a metaphor for a womb and she's holding that over her womb and then the water you know water of life coming down into this turtle vessel which sometimes the turtle you know different cultures are meant to represent the world um, you know my wife is um you know part lenape native american where that's a symbol uh, the tortoise is a symbol um and then you know the water like if you look at the water line in the back going from the left you see the water and then where the lighthouse is, it starts to be like a curling type of water. And then that's continued in the vessel and then it's continued in the bowl behind. So that, that water line is also level. And the vessel in the back, that, that's a scorpion tail that's in the center of it. Um, that represents our son, un, our unborn son. He's 17 now, but this is thinking about you know, the two of us creating and one of our greatest creations together was was our son Miles and um, his sign is um, Scorpio. So I have the tail there. So these are things that when I'm thinking about, when I'm gonna put something specifically in a piece, I want everything to mean something that we can, if someone says, why, why is that there? I can explain that. It's not just there to take up space or because compositionally it worked there. I wanna have a reason for that. And that's something my professor Jim Tanner always told me. He was like, you know, don't use a color or a form or a shape or anything in your work if you can't say what it is. Because everything doesn't have to have a deep explanation, but you're not putting things in there just because they're cool or just because it's interesting. Is Because if you wanna have work that has meaning or work that you want people to investigate and you want people to find things, then you need to put something in there to be found. And, and that's something that, that stuck with me. Um, so me, you know, as far as, you know, allegorically is I'm an artist, I'm a ceramic artist. So 
of course, I'm going to make myself in a studio. So it's about works, a lot of the tools that I use, a lot of time to make things. So you see the hourglass popping up quite a bit. Um, so this is, you know, contrasted with um, with the stone carving, where this is a, a pot on a table with a kiln, uh, you know, with a brick kiln behind it. I like to write. Um, I never, I didn't start off liking writing, um, but I do a lot of writing now. So I look at a lot of scribe images, and again, having this kind of triangular format where the book, the ruler, and the quill is, and then you have things that represent knowledge, represent writing. Again, the hourglass pops up a lot because there's a lot of time involved, and kind of using that kind of arch, um, that arch device around um, around me, just like you saw in the Botticelli piece around Venus, you know, a way to kind of isolate the person. And this is where a, a quick intermission to do the gratuitous um, how-to stuff. <laughs> so this is all about aesthetics, and I know I said that, but I just can't, the teacher in me and the sharer in me, I just can't help but show a quick overview of how do I make clay monoprints? Because sometimes so much of what you're seeing are clay monoprints. This is kind of the process. So with this particular one, start with a line of cut. The top left is a line of cut that I printed onto um, a plaster bat. The top right is having, um, whoops, the top right is having a whole lot of um, test tiles that I do to make. And then the bottom left is once it's all painted in with these underglazes and uh, watercolor underglazes and um, transparent and opaque, then on the right, wherever the transparent ones are, I put a white um, underglaze so it kind of works as a backing. Then the next thing I do is put a clay wall, like a clay dam around the perimeter pour a casting slip on there. Now you can see I, I pour, I use my hand building body as my casting slip. Now, oftentimes anything that's supposed to be made of clay in my image, I won't put any color there and I'll let the clay be the color for that piece. So once it's poured, you let it set up and then you cut those walls off. And that's where we are now. So now I'm ready to flip it. So I pray and I, I, put, I pray to the kiln gods and I hope that this will work and when you flip it, you have to cover it first with wax paper, um, put a board on it, and then just you have to, you know, handle these things. This one's a little bit heavier because it's a plaster bat. And then you flip it and then you pull off the plaster bat. And then you can see some of the material is still in the plaster bat. But when you pour the casting slip on it, it hydrates the um, image and then absorbs it into the face of it. And then this is the finished piece called Stone Carver. Um, so the reason that the, um, the stone, you know, looks so bright and I kept all those nuanced colors with the watercolors is from that backing. And then here, you, again, you can see all the different um, tools that I, would, that I use when I am doing stone carving with these, again, these little mini still lives in there. Um, you know, I have grapes in there. So, so I think, you know, when you're making work that's narrative and or it's, uh, you have things in there that are kind of allegorical, for me, it's all about the little mini still lives in there. What do I have in there for you to see? And a lot of it, again, it's all self-referential. You know, I do a lot of carving, whether it's stone um, or wood, and I, I have these tools. I have a familiarity with them. So, um, so for me, when I'm putting them in there, it's, it's a personal inclusion. But some of the figures that I like to look at, um, I, I look at workers. So this is a machinist and a machinist apprentice by Emma Stebbins. Um, I like to have that tab, I like that tablet, um, I have a compass there. And then here again, you have an anvil, you have a blacksmith's hammer. And then I also look at work that that's figurative work. And I look to see what isn't there sometimes. So with the, um, with the Vishnu, with Vishnu and this male figure from um, the late classical Mayan, um, they always have arms. A lot of the arms are broken off and, and you find that you don't need them. So with some of the figures that I make, you know, I don't have arms, right? I, I just include things that I think are important um, to the piece. This piece, you know, some of my figures have arms, but some don't. Arms would not add to this piece. Uh, the body's made out of clay. Um, the shoes are made out of wood. I st hand stitch the um, apron out of leather and carve the head out of stone. And then I have an actual little um, sculpture stand there where I made the tools and had like a little carving started. So you can see where the things that I look at, I kind of, there's things that I find interesting and I, I know I can incorporate them stylistically in what I do, but then I translate it through my own, my own view. And this is maker. For me, you know, we're all makers. Um, and I think some of my work now is sort of a statement about that. Um, and again, just sort of a, a parallel. 
And then with the narratives, you know, coming down to the stories that I like to write. Um, now, a lot of these, um, you know, just going back, you know, it's accounting or representation of real or imagined situation of, or events. So these are all imagined situations and events. These are from narratives that I write. Um, if anyone's ever, I don't know if anyone who's on here has ever had a workshop with me or heard a talk before, but probably over the last eight or nine years, I've been talking about this book that I've been writing. And I always say it's coming out this summer. <laughs> and, and obviously it has not. But um, I, with all these short stories I was writing about the things that I was doing, I decided to put them all together and make it a longer story. And then, then I was like, well, might as well write a novel. Oh, well, might as well make it a trilogy. So, so these are things for me that keep me very interested and vested in my work. But the pieces can stand, the pieces are supposed to stand on their own. They still have this bigger universal way to describe it. This is just sort of this conversation about, you know, obviously she wants to come and he is about to leave, but they're having this conversation about that. So they're still meant to just stand on our own to have the universal message that's in there, but I have this whole other story for me that goes into it. Um, again, this, you know, just in general about discovery, I have these different messengers here because it is a bit story related. This one, I love some of the Byzantine work, 14, 1500s, where um, it has gold leaf backgrounds. So with this particular clay print, um, where the hills are, where they make the horizon line, I cut them and then put a copper plate behind that. And then a wooden board that I use Gilder's uh, paste wax, that's gold on there. A lot of woodworkers use that to give a metallic look. So, so there's, you know, aesthetically, there's things that I'm mimicking in my work when I am making these narrative pieces. And then, um, and then finally getting into this, um, you know, this, I want to show how my work just can read. Um, so, so all works are meant to stand on their own, but some also create a story when grouped. Um, and these next works that I have do have specific character, characters that are part of a larger and longer narrative that specifically take place in Blue Bay. Now this image here is not of Blue Bay but I take lots of photos of bays, of lighthouses and things because I'm looking at nature, right? To bring into my work. Um, so Numo, Jem, Sally, Ander, and Ryder are primary characters of this story and all their lives change um, when they do go in to Blue Bay because they all happen to be there at the same time. So this comes from this bigger narrative that I was talking about. So if you see all these works individually, Again, hopefully they make sense by their own, but if you happen to see a show of mine where I have multiple works, then I typically have some of them hung in a particular order. So maybe you'll notice that this is sort of a, a short story that you're seeing. So the way that these read are, you know, Numo and Jem, they arrive in Blue Bay. So they are getting there early in the morning together. Um, and then, they're, you know, you do what you do, you have breakfast. There's the ship still behind them. So Blue Bay Tavern is, is where they like to have breakfast and um, they're enjoying a meal. Here, you know, they both left um, separately. He went on to do something to do different things. And then she also went off to the markets to do things. And when she's in this area with this is Sally and up front in green, they both see this person walk behind them who's Ryder, who's the antagonist. And it's a little startling because he walks by slowly to intentionally be seen. Later on, they all meet in the sail, the sail and saddle in, and with Sally Ander, who an, plays an important role in this story, and they're planning what they need to do. They Seeing Ryder um, in Blue Bay triggered something that they, they knew they had to deal with. Um, so this is them talking about what each one of them independently have to do. And then later that evening, they're having something to eat, and they have to leave. I mean, they have to they both have to leave, but they both have to leave separately to do these things that are important for the story to, to progress. And so that's why, you know, they're holding hands underneath, they're, they're encouraging each other, supporting each other. Then you see a lot of the items um, from the previous image in here that they took with them. And now it's nighttime. You see that, you know, the, um, the lighthouse behind. So, so with these stories, um, you know, so, so I am able to tell these stories that for me, I'm fully invested in. And I think all of you need to be fully invested in whatever you do, because I think that will come through your work. Um, and then I can't leave without, um, without so this is some text um, that's around it. And um, so with this, and this is sort of, this is the actual text that is in 
um, the, I guess the novel, I'll just keep calling it that I'm writing. And, you know, she's just like, no, you're going to eat that. And he's like, no, and you're going to stare at the bay all day. And you now you can, can read this behind you. I don't want to, to actually read it to you, but, but basically it's, this is about a conversation with two people sitting at the table. Um, he's eating slow. She's getting a little restless. Again, it's early. She wants to go and take advantage of the day. And she eventually discovers that, you know, he's purposely eating slow. And she's like, I'm going to go. You stay here. I know you want to go off. And there's two parts. You know, there's the markets where you can just do all types of shopping. It's kind of like a bazaar. And then there's another section of the city where all the all the craftsmen and trades are. And that's where he wants to go. He wants to go check out the smithy, see the leather worker, go to the pottery. He wants to go hang out there. So and she knows that because they do have a relationship. Um, so they stand up, smile, share, you know, share a glance and then she leaves and but he does hang out there longer because he just loves looking at the weather and then just, you know, kind of, you know, realizing like, you know, how lucky is he to, to have her but so so this is sort of all of this is going on in my mind, when I see this particular um, scene. And the hope is that if I have this much, and I've to invest into a piece, then there should be a chance that at least someone looking at it can see that two people are having breakfast, having a talk, and kind of planning things out. Um, and then that last part that I was talking about with all these different kinds of narratives, legend is the last, right? That's when the story or the myth or the allegory, um, they're believed and accepted as true. So, so my hope is um, with my work, um, and after kind of getting a little bit of an explanation of, or you know, getting a little peek into some of the stories, these, these people, these characters, these events, and you know, these situations that I'm hoping people can start to relate to and understand, they start to become real, right? It's just like, you know, I'm a, a huge you know, Marvel, I, you know, I grew up um, you know, reading comic books and I love you know, superheroes. And we all think of um, like you know, Black Panther as someone who, is, he's real to us, you know, real to me, what he represents and what he means, um, especially to, you know, to, um, to people, kids of color, something to look at and, and emulate or, or Captain America, Wonder Woman, all these different superheroes, um, they become real in people's minds because they're so familiar. Um, music that we hear, you know, um, becomes part of who we are. Um, so why can't I, why can't we do that with our artwork? You know, why can't we make work if we were kind of consistent with some of the imagery and symbolism and characters that they start to feel familiar to you. Um, and after seeing enough of my work, you might see a piece of mine in the future and you might say, oh, I think I know who that, that person is. And by thinking that, that makes that character real. And that means whatever I embedded in that character in terms of <clears throat> who that person was or wanted to convey or how you wanted to feel about them, maybe that resonated with you somehow. So that's it. Uh, I know a bit rambly in terms of things that I, I covered, but um, but that's kind of all these things are, you know, it's kind of reflective of who I am too. all these things bouncing around in my head and my mind as I have all these stories and myths and approaches to making work and statements that I want to make um, all at the same time. So, so that's it. Thank you so much, Paul. That was uh, really amazing. And uh... I don't know if I can speak for everyone, but I'm dying to find out what happens next. So we'll be waiting <laughs> for you to uh, to complete your writing. Um, well, that was really inspirational. Thank you so much for sharing um, so intimately with us and, and so broadly. Um, you gave some great advice and it was a, a true pleasure to see your work and, and hear about your, um, your, your path and your thoughts behind your work. So uh, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap it up there now and uh, We'll see you maybe again soon for a demo. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'll ask you for a demo already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, okay. I thank everyone for, for coming and listening. Um, at this point, after being on for an hour, you know, I'm a little rambly, but that's, I think my work kind of reflects how I am. <laughs> and you can see why I like to do so many different things because I, you know, I'm drawn and gravitated to so many things that cite me in the arts and it's and I hope that those of you who are on here that are students if you're excited about what you're doing just you know keep that excitement and that's going to be your fuel to to be an artist. Thank you so much um lots of thank yous here on the side and uh appreciate everybody joining us tonight and uh, I say good night to you thank you so much again Paul good All night right.
Good night, everyone.